the year is 3067. On Earth, it would be November. You are the base commander of a Draconis Combine outpost, monitoring enemy actions, and that means the Federated Suns. You intentionally chose this relatively backwater post because the enemy tends to attack frequently here, and those Federats, if you can teach them a lesson, it would significantly boost your career. Some of your loyal scouts have uh, successfully captured and interrogated some Davian spies, and you've gleaned some useful information about their actions, and you are contemplating what you will share up the command chain. You hear a bit of an odd scuffle outside your office door. The door to your office explodes into fragments of wood. Before you can react, the shimmering figure has reached your desk and a battle claw materializes out of the haze and proceeds to tear out your innards. Your last thoughts are partly of shock and disbelief and partly, damn, those Word of Blake Comstar nutcases finally snapped. And the pure fire battle armor that had just materialized before your eyes and terminated your command shimmers and disappears back into the background with its mimetic armor. Battle armor, sort of a bridge between unarmored infantry and the still small scale protomex. Battle armor was introduced into the game with the arrival of the clans in the form of elementals. These were essentially individual troopers that could take hits from mech scale weapons. Obviously being fairly effective against infantry, a, a point of five elementals was a significant match for full-size mechs. And in fact, we're going to analyze various elemental points and their variants to see how well they do against mechs later. Battle armor comes in points of five for the clans, or in groups of four for as uh, squads for the inner sphere, or as level ones of six for Comstar or Word of Flake. There are a lot of variants and subvariants within those variants and it's easy to become overwhelmed. I have picked a selection to analyze for combat performance and for closer looks that gives an interesting spread of the various combinations that would be typical. I wanted to make sure to have at least some light and assault variants, but I have stuck mostly to medium weight class that have battle claws because those are the ones that are effective in anti-mech attacks. So I have focused mostly on that class. I also tried to stick to battle armor units that you can find on eBay like currently. Like typically you would find these showing up either being sold by Ironwind Metals or as some sort of uh, one of the vintage antique units that still float around uh, for sale every once in a while. It's worthy to note in lore that the original battle armor or power armor was actually a power armor light classification called the Nighthawk from the Star League, the original Star League. Uh, however, it was mostly just a 
like a stealth suit for special ops and wasn't really meant for fighting against mechs. So battle armor comes in a few different sizes or size classes. The lightest is power armor or PA slash L. Sometimes I call battle armor power armor just indiscriminately. That's just my way of naming things. You can think of power armor as just a very light exo frame, very little armor possibly, mostly just to help carry heavier payloads. I don't consider power armor slash exo frames as really meant to be used for combat. I would reserve that for the light and medium class battle armor. Then next comes the uh, light battle armor. And one of the most famous uh, versions of light power armor is the Sylph. That's the clan VTOL flying armor. I'll talk about the Sylph when I go over variants, but it's worthy to note that there's a couple variants and one of them basically only has a one-shot bomb rack and pretty much almost no other weapons on it and its purpose is to just fly over the target and drop a bomb. The most common battle armor is the medium. This would include elementals and purifiers and almost all major battle armor. This is because this is the heaviest that can effectively do anti-mech attacks. And this weighs one ton per trooper, so a intersphere squad is four tons, which is roughly equivalent to a jump platoon of unarmored infantry. Um, and a, of course a clan point would be five tons. These of course fit into Karnovs, but usually you would carry these on mechs or omnimechs as uh, mechanized infantry. Another important feature of the medium battle armor is that you can get jump jets for it, which means you can now drop it out of Karnovs, or it can just use the jump jets for maneuvering and movement, which is very useful. Then there would be the heavy class, which should be the uh, up to up to uh, 1500 kilograms of weight, significantly more firepower, but of course slower moving. I do not like heavy battle armor just because it's not a medium and mediums can do anti-mech attacks well whereas heavies can't really and it's not an assault so it is like heavier than a medium but lighter than assault but I personally don't see it as serving a purpose. And then finally you have the uh, assault class which is two tons per trooper. That means you have a, in order to have a squad, you have basically eight tons. Kind of hard to transport, but there actually is a variant of the Karnov that I think can fit eight tons and uh, thus could, in theory, carry assault battle armor. But because you can't get jump jets for this class of battle armor, that means the Karnov would have to land in order to drop you off at your fighting destination, and so the Karnov would have some chance of getting shot down in the process. A good solution to this is get shown in the Fenrir variant. It's basically a quad, and it has extra land movement, so it just runs faster. So that kind of gives you some mobility. Now, if you uh, happen to have a clan elemental, its SRM2 is actually two separate SRM1s. That is, you can have all your elementals shoot one of their tubes at mech A and their second tube all at mech B. Plus, they get an extra reload of the tubes afterwards. There's like a second volley, which you can choose to all shoot at the same target or you could split into two separate targets. However, it's not quite like two SRM1s because the uh, you can't choose to not shoot one of the tubes if you're shooting 
the other tube. So both tubes have to be shot, but they can split their targets. For non-SRM weapons, you basically look up how many weapons hit, figure out how much damage that is, and then do five point groupings with a leftover group at the end, and you distribute that way. Battle armor will often have what's called a modular weapons mount or a modular turret. And this can usually hold a few set specific weapons, like either a small laser or a machine gun or some other thing like that. Now these are actually mech scale weapons as far as damage is concerned, but they are like miniaturized to work specifically with battle armor. So when it's a small laser, it's a small laser that's specifically for battle armor, even though it does mech scale damage. They will often also have something called the AP mount or anti-personnel mount. That's specifically for holding like a machine gun, but only an anti-personnel machine gun, not a mech scale one. Or like a submachine gun or like a rifle or something like that. And if you do have the battle claw in a medium size or smaller, then you follow the same rules as classic infantry for anti-mech attacks. You can either do a leg attack or a swarm attack. In the lore, the elemental, when it first arrived, seemed nearly invincible. It could take multiple hits from medium lasers, plus it could jump. This gave it the nickname of a toad. Initially, the clans won all battles and the toads were adding to the mysticism of the invincibility of the clans. But eventually the clans lost a few battles and some of the elemental battle armor were salvaged and reverse engineered. The inner sphere standard was meant to counter the clan elemental, but of course with inferior tech and capabilities it does have nine armor and a small laser and jump jets, but it was missing its SRM packs, like uh, unlike the elemental. So the inner sphere Baka is the version that has no jump jets, but has SRM packs instead. Its name Baka comes from, from the error message that is activated on the heads-up display when the pilot erroneously tries to jump. Early variants of the Inner Sphere standard were called Gorilla Suits, and here's a picture of one in action. The Grey Death variants were created by the Grey Death Legion survivors that created a private enterprise as a military contractor. Its initial purpose was to be a more manufacturable, cheaper version of the Inner Sphere standard. It is a pretty basic battle armor. No jump jets, no missile launcher, just a small laser and a battle claw. The Grey Death Strike variant has a light tag and an SRM-3. Its primary purpose is to support the Grey Death Standards as a fire support unit, also as a targeting assistant with the light tag. The Achilles armor, here showing a Merrick variant, is split between the Word of Blake and Merrick. Actually a joint venture between the uh, Word of Blake scientists and Merrick scientists. Here we're taking a closer look at the machine gun variant. It's got uh, six points of armor plus stealth armor and jump. The standard Achilles has a small laser on its modular weapons mount instead of a machine gun, but no battle claw. The Raiden is a very popular and fairly cost effective design. This one is a Kurita variant where it originated. A classic Raiden battle armor 
has the basic battle claw and a, and a modular weapon mount on which it either puts a small laser or a machine gun or possibly a flamer. Here we're looking at the MRM version. That's right, it has an MRM tube. The Sylph is a VTOL capable light battle armor from the clans. Its primary features are a micro pulse laser as well as a one shot bomb rack. I'm personally not a fan of it, but its bomb is a high explosive so it can hit every trooper in a battle armor unit at the same time or it can hit multiple units if they are stacked together in the same hex. The upgraded Sylph is more of a direct machine gun direct damage unit rather than an attempt at uh, dropping bombs. Later on variants of the Sylph that had heavier chassis and that gave up flight and things like that came about but I won't cover them here. The Fenrir is a quad assault battle armor, so it weighs two tons. It has a turret that can hold a variety of weapons. The small laser variant of the Fenrir has three small lasers on its modular turret. The Fenrir often has either three smaller weapons, two mid-sized weapons, or one larger weapon on its mount. One of the interesting variants has an SRM-4. The small pulse laser version has two small pulse lasers on its turret. And if that's not enough pulse for you, there's even a single medium pulse laser variant. And if that's not enough for you, there is a ER medium laser with a full mech scale ER medium laser on it variant. The Fenrir is relatively lightly armored though. In fact, it has less armor than some medium battle armors. So the strategy is use the extreme firepower to knock down the enemy before the fact that you have little armor becomes too much of a liability. And then, of course, there's the clan elemental. Originally starting off as a diving suit by Clan Goliath Scorpion. Clan Wolf bought a bunch of those diving suits and started adding weapons to them as an experiment. Whereas Clan Hell's Horses experimented with genetically engineered super soldiers. Although Wolf first used them against Nova Cat, when Wolf finally went up against Hell's Horses, the two sides both coveted the other's techniques and thus combined the battle armor with the genetically engineered super soldier. Elemental suits also have a special hard gel that keeps the uh, user alive if they have been shot by, by a heavy weapon. There are many variants of the elemental. This one here has a uh, heavy machine gun, a battle claw, and an anti-personnel mount. Because the modular weapons mount easily mounts other weapons on it, you can also get the ER micro laser variant. Or for better use against troopers, you can get the micro pulse laser variant. And then if you want the uh, standard war crimes version, then you get the flamer elemental for extra anti-personnel action. And then a relatively mundane variant, but uh, lower cost. So you can get the machine gun variant. The, that modular weapons mount just allows you to switch your weapons just like with an Omni mech. The classic vanilla elemental, if you don't know which elemental you have, this is the one you have, has a clan spec ER small laser as well as the battle claw. All of the elementals have battle claws. That's not all. Don't forget you still have those SRM2 packs as well. There are more exotic variants of the elemental such as the gnome which is basically just a heavy version. 
There's also the Undine or the Undine, which is an underwater version. And then there's the Salamander, which is the strict anti-personnel version based on just heat weapons and anti-fire armor. However, in my personal opinion, the medium standard elemental is the best because it gives you the option for those mechanized infantry uh, anti-mech attacks by doing the swarm or leg attacks. And you don't really need the underwater capabilities of the Undine unless that's you're in an exotic uh, scenario. And then we have the Purifier. The Word of Blake version, usually high-tech. Standard Purifier is also known as the Purifier Adaptive, which has a mimetic armor that gives it bonuses, essentially giving it invisibility if it doesn't move. There are several variants of the Purifier, and I'm going to focus on just the extra variant of the Purifier Terra Squad, this is the version that uh, defended Earth. So how do these various battle armors actually rack up in battle? And how do they perform? These sims assume fully populated squads for Inner Sphere, and fully populated points for clan, and fully populated level ones, that is six, po six power armor units for any Word of Blake or Comstar units like the Purifiers. Well, now that I've broken out the uh, win rates to show win rates against light as well as assault mechs, for example, and not just only showing the all win rate, if you look at the far right, you can find a few that, for example, have a 4% win rate. So basically, the Fenrir with the ER medium laser beats 4% of all assault mechs. Another one of interesting note would be the Purifier Terra Squad. That's particularly because it's got six units in it. And with that ER small laser, it actually has quite a lot of punch to it. Because it's like a clan spec ER small laser, so it's really almost like a medium laser, except it's like six of them, so it's a rotor yacht cannon. There are some significant spreads in the battle value, though, of these various squads and points and level ones. The uh, MRM tube Raiden only has 183 battle value, whereas the Purifier Terras have like 700 battle value. And my favorites regarding win rates. The Fenrir with the SRM-4, that is what I call the Fenrir squad, as well as the uh, Raiden with the machine gun, um, elementals with micro uh, pulse lasers, um, the Sylph with the upgrade, that is the double machine gun, and a couple others. The thing about the battle value for battle armor is that it doesn't scale linearly with the number of units. So when you have six units in the same squad or, well, level one, it actually costs as much uh, as nine times just having one unit. It's a nonlinear cost function. But this is fair or reasonable um, or even possibly still undercosted because when you have four of a unit versus six of a unit. The six of a unit is not 1.5 times stronger than four of a unit. It's actually 36 divided by 16 um, times stronger for reasons which I will get into in a future video when I do the infantry video. It has the last words on power armor per se. If you wanna see power armor in action, you should see the video on the uh, on the Omega that has a battle report in it with power armor in action. At a risk of driving you insane, um, I'm now going to quickly go through the entire calculation matrix of all the mechs, vehicles, and infantry. I'm not really trying to go through them carefully here. I'm just going to flip through them quickly and you can pause and look at these if you want. 
So, but this gives you the current state of the full calculation matrix. Everything has been updated and recalculated freshly. I have only changed one rule from previous calculations, and that is arrow 4 will no longer be used unless there is a friendly unit with tag. And this means any units that only have arrow 4s as weapons are essentially disarmed and will have a 0% win rate because they will only be able to use whatever secondary weapons they might have, if any. So if a mech seems to have a lot of variants ready for it in this calculation matrix, it means I'm mostly prepared to make a video on that mech or unit. Now, if I have not yet done a particular mech or unit, but you see a lot of variants for it, well, there's still a chance that some of those variants might have some incorrect settings or configurations or whatnot. So if there's any specific mech you want to have covered soon or next, then if you look through these lists, you'll find the ones that are ready. Some that are of note are, for example, the Marauder, the Thug, the Centurion, uh, the Crusader, Stinger, the King Crab. Those are fairly well developed now and I could do next. And remember that thing I said about six of a unit versus four of a unit being actually 36 divided by 16 times as strong. Well, we can kind of get an example of that by looking at these group combat or these multi-combat results. Look at these two LRM platoons versus six LRM platoons. If you look at the win rate against assault mechs, you'll notice that two LRM platoons only wins 2% of the time, but six can win 46% of the time. And this is related to a real-life concept called defeat in detail. But uh, I like to refer to this as combat density in, within Battletech.